Hi guys, so this video is looking at complex inheritance. So you guys have kind of come from simple Mendelian genetics, and that's where genes have two copies that you get, one from mom, one from dad. And we've talked about sort of different vocabulary for what you can have on those genes. So maybe you got two dominant copies, one dominant, one recessive, or two recessive copies. And the kind of basis that we're working on here is that of those genes, there are two versions or two alleles, a dominant and a recessive. And we've said that up until now, a dominant version will always express itself in the phenotype if it's present. Our first kind of foray into complex inheritance is going to be looking at patterns that sort of bend that simple dominant recessive inheritance. We're going to be looking at co-dominance and incomplete dominance. So the important thing to kind of note here is that when we're moving forward and we get into some mixed practice, so where I'm giving you some simple Mendelian, some complex inheritance, unless you are either explicitly told in the question, so this trait follows co-dominance, this trait follows incomplete dominance, or you are told the phenotype so that you can infer, oh, this is an example of co-dominance, this is an example of incomplete dominance. Please do not move forward just assuming that every genetics problem that you get is going to be follow some pattern of complex inheritance. Please make sure you're kind of doing that, that mental legwork to make sure that you're looking or there's indications in the problem itself that you should be using these. So since we're going to be kind of bending Mendel's law of dominance, let's do a quick review. So Mendel said that there are two alleles or versions of every gene, and he said that one will always overshadow the other. So what this essentially means that in your two chromosomes, one recipe, if it's present, will always get transcribed and translated, meaning you'll always make that protein, you'll always see it in the phenotype. And so that is what we have called the dominant trait. What we're going to see now is how that's not always the case with every single gene. So there's some gray area when it comes to that. The first gray area that we're going to look at is codominance. So this is on the top of page 23. should be able to go through this kind of quickly so you get some fill-in so you can come back and use this as reference. So co as a prefix means together, like if you cohabitate with members of your family. You might have co-teachers or people that are teaching together in some of your classes. You coexist with other humans and animals on this planet. So co means together. When we have a co-dominant trait, it means that there is no difference in your homozygotes, meaning individuals that have two copies of the same allele, that's what they're going to have in their phenotype. It is your heterozygote where something interesting is going to happen. In your heterozygote in co-dominance, you are actually going to see both of those alleles express themselves in the phenotype. So this literally means that you'll be able to visualize both of those proteins being expressed at the same time only in the heterozygote. And I'll show you coming some examples of what this looks like. So because some kind of examples we can put a finger on. There are certain breeds of chickens that show co-dominance. So for example, this white chicken would be homozygous for white. This black chicken would be homozygous for black, but in your heterozygotes, this individual would have inherited one copy of the white allele, one copy of the black allele. Do you notice how it has black and white feathers? So this is what it means by it expresses both proteins. You literally can see both genes at the same time. Same thing down here. So we have a red fish. So this fish would be homozygous for red. This would be homozygous for blue. And then your heterozygote, I see the red and I see the blue. And last example, you guys are hopefully getting the feel for what codominance looks like. In your flowers here, you have homozygous for white, homozygous for red, and then your heterozygous, I see both the red and the white. So in codominance, both are acting as though they're dominant. They're both going to express themselves and you're going to see it in that phenotype. So how this breaks Mendel's laws or bends it, because we still have dominance working here, is that Mendel really thought phenotype was binary. He thought it was this or it was that. He kind of never really um, was able to visualize or theorize about the fact that you could have a third phenotype that would express both. And he didn't see this in any of his data, but we now know that this is something you can actually see in genetic traits and organisms on planet Earth. So this is, again, kind of a third phenotype emerging in that heterozygote that has both of those proteins being expressed. How we show codominance, codominance uses a little bit of an interesting notation. You're gonna use one capital letter to represent the gene. So for example, if we were looking at a gene that codes for scale color in fish, I might designate this by a capital letter F, and that would mean gene that represents or that codes for scale color. 
the different alleles or versions of that gene now become superscripts. So those little letters that are in the upper corner right there. So if I wanted to express a gene that codes for red coloring, it would be big F for the gene itself with a superscript and everything's in capitals here. Notice that because we're co-dominant, no recessives here, so no lowercase letters. So capital F with a capital R, this would be a gene that codes for red scale coloring. If I wanted to look at a scale that codes for blue scale coloring, still capital F, because remember, we're still in the scale color gene, but now the superscript is a capital B to represent the allele or version for that gene for blue. If we look at our genotypes to get our different phenotypes, this fish right here that is all red would have, since it's diploid, two copies of the red gene allele. So look, we have FR, FR, and it's red. My blue fish over here is homozygous for the blue alleles, so FB, FB. And my heterozygote, and I can always identify the heterozygote and codominance because you're going to see that they have both. So if this thing's black and this thing's white, your heterozygote is black and white. If this fish is red, this fish is blue, your heterozygote is red and blue. So when you guys have to do some identification on your own based off phenotypes, just look in codominance. Your heterozygote is the one that's got both of those being expressed. So how we get there genetically is this individual has one allele for red coloring, one allele for blue coloring. So this would be on one chromosome, this would be on the other chromosome. Both of those proteins get transcribed and translated. So there you go, you see them both. We're gonna do a little practice right here. So we're gonna, we're gonna up our game just a little bit with looking at blood type. And blood type is a little funky in the sense that we have A and B, which are co-dominant meaning if you inherited a copy of the A blood type from one parent and a copy of the B blood type from the other parent, you would be what we would call type AB blood. It's relatively rare. But we also notice, this is the step up portion, unlike fish scale coloring where it was red or blue and then the heterozygote is red and blue, you also have a little dominance and recessive at play here with blood type because there is this thing called blood type O. And blood type O is recessive to both A and B. So you notice something kind of cool here. These are these look like ones, and I, I apologize that this chart is not as beautiful as I was like. These are actually capital I's to represent immunoglobulin. So this is actually the protein that's on the outside that we're trying to designate for your blood type. So if you have type A blood, and some of you might know your blood type, which is cool. If you are homozygous for type A, then it means that you are IA, IA. So I have two copies of the A allele, and I am type A blood. But you can also be heterozygous for A. Now, in order to be heterozygous for A, you have to have one copy of that dominant A allele, and then the second one would be a recessive O. And again, remember, A and B follow simple dominant recessive over O. So this one would be heterozygous for A. We notice the same thing happening with B. You can get two copies of the B allele and be homozygous for B, or you can get one copy of B and one copy of O and be what we call heterozygous. And then right here, I wish I had a little star that was animated in, your AB is where you see your codominance. Again, if you are inheriting one allele of A and one allele of B from a parent, you express growth on the outside of your red blood cells, and you would have what we call blood type AB. In order to be type O, which is actually really common just because the O allele is really common in the population, you have to have two of those recessive alleles. So if you have any A's or B's, remember they will express themselves because they're dominant. So let's try this one. A woman is heterozygous for type A blood and has a child with a man who is heterozygous for type B. What is the probability they will have a child with type AB blood? All right. So hopefully you did your math out and checked yourself. Let's see what we got here. So the first thing we have to do is to determine genotypes for these individuals. I used my chart kind of in my notes to help me with this. I'm told the woman is heterozygous for type A and I put her in yellow. So she would be I-A-I-O. So again, if she was homozygous for A, it would be I-A-I-A. And the man is heterozygous for B. So we get I-B-I-O. We then are going to do what we've always done, Punnett square. Now this one looks a little funky because remember that the capital letter and the superscript are one representation of a gene. So they need to stay together. So every now and then I get a student who will write capital I and then A-B as both the superscripts. And that's not the correct way to do this. Remember, the capital letter with the one superscript represents what's on one gene or one chromosome. And so we need to have two representations in each of these boxes. So this, this box right here shows the IAIB, IAIO, IBIO, and IOIO. Well, that sounds like Snow White. 
So you, um, if you flip this, so if you put um, the man's alleles on top and mom's down the side, you should still have the same proportions. Your just might look a little different than mine. So now I have to interpret this. So whenever we make a Punnett square, it's a tool for solving for genetics probability. So we would go back to the question. We say, what is the probability they will have a child with AB blood type? Well, I know they need one copy of the A allele and one copy of the B allele. So I notice that I have one out of four or a 25% chance. That's what I'm going to see in my offspring. All right, so your next one is incomplete dominance. So this is, again, where the heterozygote is showing a unique kind of third phenotype. However, it is different from codominance. In codominance, the heterozygote is going to show both of the other phenotypes. So think the chicken was, if you were homozygous for black, you were a black chicken. If you were homozygous for white, you were a white chicken. But if we were a heterozygous chicken, we had black and white feathers. What we're going to see here in incomplete dominance is that the heterozygote is a blend of the two homozygotes. So this would be, for example, if we were to stick with the chickens, the chicken wouldn't be black and white as a heterozygote. It would be gray. So I think of this always as like paint can genetics where you get a blend of the two extremes. So this is, again, unique because you're getting a third phenotype that's emerging in your heterozygote. Homozygotes are unchanged. Two examples from nature. We have what's known as a roan horse, and you guys might have seen this before. If you are homozygous for chestnut coloring, so this is a dark brown, then you are a chestnut colored horse. If you are homozygous for white coloring, then you are a white horse. But if you happen to cross these two and they get one copy of the chestnut allele and one copy of the white allele, you can get this really beautiful kind of like light brown color in your horses, and this is called a roan horse. We also see it again in flowers. Flowers show a lot of complex inheritance when it comes to their coloring. So for example, right here, you can be homozygous for red and be a red flower, homozygous for white and be a white flower, but the heterozygote is a blend of the two. It is pink, it is pink. So how do I differentiate between these two in problems? Well, you look at the heterozygote. If the heterozygote is a blend of the two, but expresses neither in its, complete, in its total isolated form, then you are looking at incomplete dominance. If the heterozygote expresses both of them, so both of your homozygous traits, then you're looking at codominance. Again, this breaks Mendel's laws because Mendel says we should not have a third phenotype. Mendel kind of was able to, to exist in this genetics world of, you know, where there's a binary. You were there this, or you were this, there was no third. And there's a nice example on the bottom down here for another uh, mouse fur coloring also shows incomplete dominance where homozygous black mouse, homozygous white mouse can have a gray mouse offspring. This has a different notation as well. And these notations are important because occasionally on MCAS and also if you ever want to take AP bio or do some advanced genetics work, they'll expect that you're familiar with the different notations and being able to interpret and do them in genetics. So here with incomplete dominance, the notation is a little bit different in that you are going to choose different letters to represent the different alleles for this gene. So for example, hair texture in humans follows incomplete dominance. If an individual is homozygous for straight hair, which I am using the letter S to represent the straight hair allele. So if someone is has two copies of that, then they would have straight hair. Same thing, we have a different allele. So this in case C represents curly. So if an individual is homozygous for curly, then they have curly hair. But my heterozygote shows a blend of the two. So if they inherit one copy of the straight hair allele and one copy of the hair, uh, curly hair allele, so if they're SC, then they would have wavy hair. They would have wavy hair. So here, let's try this problem. A curly-haired man has a child with a wavy-haired woman. What percentage of their offspring will have wavy hair? Good. So hopefully we follow the same basic steps we always have. So we define genotypes. So we are told that the man has curly hair. We'll do his first. So curly-haired male. So that means that his he is homozygous for curly hair. And the woman has wavy hair, so she's going to have, that's your intermediate trait. So that's my heterozygote. So that means they have one of the straight hair allele, one of the curly hair allele. And then like we've always done, we plug it into a Punnett square to get our probabilities. So I put mom's alleles on top, dad's alleles down the side, and then I need to interpret. So the question is, what percentage of their children will have wavy hair? So I need to remember that wavy hair is my intermediate phenotype, meaning I'm looking for a heterozygous genotype. So one copy of the straight allele, one copy of the curly allele. And I notice that these two boxes out of four, so two out of four or 50% chance 
that they will have a child with wavy hair. Quick thing, I do want you to be consistent with the notation today. The very start of the practice problems I give you guys today gives you three phenotypes. Like it'll say hair texture in humans can either be straight, wavy, or curly. Please create a trait key for this one. So the first thing you have to do for part one in the practice problems today is you have to determine, am I looking at header, uh, in codominance or incomplete dominance? And then once you have that, I want your trait key is essentially you listing the traits so much like you've done here. Oops. This right here is a trait key. So notice how it's got the genotypes defined and then the phenotype. So that means if I were doing this in practice number one, I would pick letters and you get to pick your own letters today. And I would say, because I know I'm looking at incomplete dominance, I'm going to choose one letter to represent one homozygous, one letter to represent the other homozygote, and then my heterozygote is going to be my intermediate trait. So you're essentially creating these for part one for each of the different examples. So identify whether it's codominance, incomplete dominance, and then create a chart just like this using the notation from this video. So a nice way to practice. I'll click back through. There we go. All right. So do now. You guys have practice problems for codominance and incomplete dominance on page 25. Keep in mind, question number one is that one where you're creating the trait keys. You got to make the determination of what type of inheritance it is and then be consistent with the uh, notation as a practice. Go through and try those. Um, let me know if you have any questions. Good luck.